Uh, thank you, Ken Corley. And firstly, can I uh, put on the record and, and thank Minister Roderick O'Gorman and indeed more latterly Minister, Minister of State Joe O'Brien uh, for their engagement and for their courtesy at every step of the way um, when, I, when I have engaged with them in relation to uh, this issue. Uh, and I'm sure when the Green Party sought the responsibility for this area, uh, their objective was to eliminate uh, direct provision uh, and not to extend it. Uh, but that was in a time um, before uh, the war in Ukraine. Uh, and indeed, the wars and the famine uh, and the persecution uh, the world over. Uh, and now we're de left with a situation in, ter in terms of dealing with vast numbers of people coming to our countries uh, seeking asylum. And I've often said, and I firmly believe, uh, the lottery of birth uh, determines so many of our outcomes. It determines our outcomes even in terms of being born into a functioning family, being born into a family where there's no poverty. But it clearly determines in terms of in what country uh, that you're born. Uh, and for all uh, the challenges we face here in our country, we are extremely fortunate. We're extremely fortunate uh, to live in a prosperous, developed country uh, with a functioning democracy. And I must acknowledge, to be fair, uh, for the most part, uh, both government and opposition haven't used uh, this, or opposition, I should say, haven't used uh, this crisis as an opportunity uh, to exploit fear. There is a minority that is, but for the most part, uh, they're not, and that must be uh, acknowledged. Uh, and you know, when we compa compare our lot um, with the people uh, who are coming, as I said, fleeing war, uh, flee in famine, uh, flee in persecution for maybe their sexuality, uh, for their religious beliefs. Um, we are very fortunate. And if you look at our own history, if you look, and we're, the, our president acknowledged uh, and commemorated the famine only the weekend gone by, at a time when a million people left our shore because of what we were facing, uh, and who went uh, in their droves to Canada, to the US, if you look at, as a state, uh, as we grappled with so many challenges from the 1920s right down through uh, the, the various decades, how many of our people left our shores, went to the UK, went to South America, went to America, uh, for an opportunity um, to have a better chance in life. Uh, so, you know, leaving aside the legal obligations that we have as a state, I believe that we have many moral obligations and a moral duty uh, to assist people who, by for no other reason but lottery of birth, uh, find themselves uh, in the situation that they're in. And I think, you know, any fair-minded person would have to acknowledge that a time when 73,000 Ukrainians, Ukrainians have come into this country, uh, and up until the 14th of May, uh, 20,450 people seeking international protection. That is a serious number of people that are coming in that we have to respond to. Uh, and I must compliment and I indeed thank the Irish citizens because for the most part, they have been extremely welcoming uh, of uh, people coming to our shores. They have opened their houses. And I must say there still is situations, Minister, where pledges have not been uh, accepted and implemented, and that, that shouldn't be the case. But only on Sunday, I was in uh, Moat running a 5K road race, and I met a Ukrainian people who came in, 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 in January. The young girl came second in her category, uh, and one of the, the adults was there. They were so thankful for the welcome uh, that they got in in, in County Westmead, and that's replicated so many other places. But the one thing they asked me when they found out I was a politician is, where can we go to get work? Can you help me get work? Because I want to contribute back uh, to society uh, and uh, the country. But 12 months on, Minister, I think we need to reassess our response uh, and acknowledge while it has been hugely challenging and we have made huge strides and huge progress, there are areas that we have operated below par. And I think uh, we need to look at that now and see how we can bring that area forward. And one area is in the area of communication. I think, you know, the absence of effective communication 
leads a vacuum uh, for misinformation and leaves an opportunity uh, for people with an agenda uh, to exploit uh, legitimate fears uh, and concerns. And I think we have to be very careful, Minister, um, for people who have legitimate fears uh, that they are engaged with, that they are adequately informed, and they are reassured, um, and their concerns are addressed. Because if we don't, we run the risk of forcing those people into the extreme right to be exploited further. And I think we need to improve on our communications. Another area uh, which is concerning is in terms of the processing of uh, international protection applications. Uh, only 5,000 of the 20,450 uh, applications that are here have been granted status to remain. Um, the process needs to be more transparent, it needs to be faster, it needs to be streamlined, and we need to have a better use of technology. Uh, interviews can be held remotely uh, over Zoom and Skype. We, we've done, most of us are conducting much of our business that way now. Uh, the bet needs to be better use of technology in terms of uh, translation uh, for people coming from other countries. Um, and I think, uh, you know, the facility for mul multiple appeals, that needs to be looked at uh, also. Because applications must be brought uh, to their natural conclusion uh, in a timely fashion. The other area, Minister, I've raised this before, is the, the non-implementation of the Dublin Convention and the number of people who are actually moving through safe countries uh, to come to Ireland. That is a duplication on, of a process, and that is uh, making the problem uh, of processing application even more difficult. And I think it's an area uh, where, we need to, where we need to put a little bit more of attention and more focus on. People arriving without passports. Uh, Minister, nobody can embark a plane without a passport. And I think engagement, and I've made this suggestion both to the Minister for Justice uh, and the Minister for Foreign Affairs, uh, sorry, the Minister for Transport, uh, that they should engage with the airline industries. Uh, when you're presenting to get on a flight, you have to put on, put, present your boarding pass along with your passport. The, pa the passport can be scanned so that people's documentation will be on record and will help uh, when they come to seek uh, processing of uh, international uh, protection. Because as I said, to maintain a confidence in the system, the system needs to be fair, transparent, and all applications brought to the rightful uh, conclusion. I want to compliment Minister Jack Chambers uh, because I think the recognition of Ukrainian driving licenses uh, is very important. It affords people who want to work and contribute to our society the opportunity to do so in a sector that badly needs uh, workers. And we know that many people who are seeking international protection are economic uh, asylum seekers. We should look at reviewing uh, the work permit process to afford the people who are coming here an opportunity to work, particularly in, se in sectors of the con economy where there is a need for people to work. We have met, I meet ambassadors who's coming here, who's bringing forward solutions in terms of if work permits was given to uh, people coming in, they would want to work and contribute, particularly uh, in the construction uh, society. Uh, the rollout of modular bills uh, and pods. Uh, Minister, I don't know what the OPW has been doing for 12 months, uh, but um, 750 modular units, number one, I don't believe is enough. And number two, the time that it has taken uh, to get these on the, on the ground is simply embarrassing. Uh, when you look, uh, and Billy Kelleher uh, visited Ukraine uh, and showed how in a space of a number of months, in a war-stricken uh, country, they could produce a modular unit to accommodate 300 people. Uh, I don't know why we can't do it uh, faster. And I don't know why the planet, plan and exemption, the statutory instrument, and it's not under your remit, it's under the, the planning and housing remit, but why there was an exemption for modular units for planning uh, for temporary asylum seekers, but there's no exemption 
for modular units, for planning, uh, for international protection assignment seekers. What's the differentiation there? And it's in, in, in the latter is where we're se severely challenged uh, to find uh, space. That's something that should be looked upon. And I believe there is uh, existing uh, providers that may be able to take on more uh, or house more people seeking international protection if that plan and exemption uh, was extended. Uh, the tourism and the hospitality sector is a sector which really was the backbone in driving our uh, recovery after the last recession. And I have a concern with our over-dependence on that sector uh, of the, the economy. It's not a sector that you can switch on and switch off uh, like a light switch. And that's why I firmly believe, Minister, we need to revisit um, the state buildings uh, that are available. Um, you know, we had a report recently where we had housing within the Department of Defence, uh, totally underutilised. Um, I've given an example in my own constituency, in Mullingar, Colin Barracks. I've been through the buildings. They are, with some modification, would be able to accommodate uh, more people. But instead of utilising and investing in these buildings, which would be there for the long-term benefit of our community, we're putting modular units uh, in in column barracks. Uh, we should be using those buildings more effectively. And only a few months ago, the OPW that I mentioned a few minutes ago in relation to modular homes had an old uh, police or Garda barracks uh, on the open market to sell and two houses at a time when you have asked your colleagues across the department to bring forward uh, suitable buildings and were selling buildings in certain instances. Uh, there are state buildings out there with the, with the right investment can be brought up to a standard and I believe we need to do that um, much, much better, much more effectively uh, than we're doing uh, at the moment. Uh, and finally, two points. Uh, Minister, I want you to double check when you go back that everybody who has a contract uh, to offer a service to this state, that that contract is not being underutilised. And when I say that, I mean that there's no hotelier or private occupier out there who are getting paid for rooms that are not being used. Um, I would have a worry and a concern that there could be uh, instances of that, and that's something that needs to be addressed. And finally, I want to take the opportunity to acknowledge um, the decision by government uh, to introduce uh, the Community Recognition Fund. There were some very, very good projects uh, funded through that fund, and it is something uh, that will help uh, to build uh, better integration uh, between uh, our long-term members of community and our new members of community. And that's something that we should all strive to achieve.